this Friday night finally headed home. The first group of Hamas hostages and Israeli prisoners free. The pause in the fighting and the essential aid quickly now moving in. The politics of backing Ukraine. The dwindling support among Canadian conservatives for the war-torn nation. Tis the season for giftflation. It's hard to stay within budget this year. How rising prices could be pinching holiday shoppers. And iced out how the NHL is blocking a goalie from honoring his wife's indigenous heritage. Global National with Baran Asser. <laughs> Cars covered with the internationally recognized Red Cross, carrying what many see as a beacon of hope. 24 men, women and children freed by Hamas after nearly seven weeks in captivity. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Amid high tensions, there is a small sense of relief in the Middle East tonight as Israel and Hamas completed the first of what's expected to be a series of prisoner exchanges. Of the 24 hostages released, 13 were Israeli, mainly elderly women and children, ranging in age from as young as two all the way to 85 years old. Thai and Filipino nationals also among those freed, seen in this Hamas video as they were escorted into Red Cross vehicles earlier today. <laughs> This is one of the goals of Israel's war on Hamas, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said in a televised address tonight. However, he vowed that Israel would achieve all of its goals. And in the West Bank, cheers rang out as 39 Palestinian women and teens were released from Israel's Ofer military prison. Just a few of the 300 individuals who Israel considered for release. This breakthrough is part of a meticulously negotiated deal that comes with a four-day pause in fighting and some much-needed humanitarian aid being delivered into Gaza. We'll have more on that in a moment, but we begin with Mike Armstrong and the long-awaited exchange that came after weeks of relentless violence and thousands of civilian deaths. The first sightings of the hostages were on social media. Videos shared showing Red Cross jeeps cheered as they moved through Gaza. The convoy crossed into Egypt at 5.53 p.m. local time. From there, the hostages moved through Egypt to a border crossing with Israel where they were turned over to Israeli teams waiting to receive them. Now, among those released, the oldest hostage, 85-year-old Rafa Adar. Hello. The two youngest are this man's children, taken by Hamas with their mother October 7th. The last news anyone had about them was this video. That's Doran Katz Asher having her head covered. The couple's two-year-old and four-year-old children are seen hiding their faces. Now, what wasn't expected was another group of hostages whose release wasn't announced in advance. According to Cotter, which worked as a mediator in this agreement, 10 Thai citizens and one Filipino were also handed over to the Red Cross. They were met in Egypt by officials from their embassies. There was also cheering for the prisoners going the other way in this exchange. 39 Palestinians from an Israeli prison in the West Bank. Crowds had gathered on a hill to watch. There were also crowds in the streets. Israel released 24 women and 15 teenage boys. Among them, Laith Othman, the 17-year-old, was detained earlier this year on suspicion of throwing an incendiary device. He says life in the prison was hard, they weren't allowed out of their cells, and he says prisoners were starving. There were emotional moments for Mara Bakir. She was arrested at 16 after an altercation with a police officer. After serving eight years, she was told Friday morning she was being released. <laughs> Bakir says she met people who helped her in prison, but that there's no one more important than her mother. <laughs> Now, the next hours will be intense. The hostages will be reunited with family, but they'll also be debriefed. Israeli teams will try to collect intelligence on where the hostages were being held so as to perhaps find out where the rest might be. The Israeli military has agreed not to use drones or aircrafts to monitor Gaza during this four-day pause, but it still has satellites and every part of this handover was being followed. 
They want to know where each Hamas fighter came from and where they went afterwards. One Israeli officer joked confidently today with an interviewer. Just between us, he said, we'll be watching very closely. Farah? Mike Armstrong in Jerusalem. Thank you, Mike. And just before the pause began, the Israeli Defense Forces says it demolished a Hamas tunnel under the El Shifa hospital and other tunnel entrances in the area. This unverified footage published by the IDF shows the destruction of the tunnels and what it says are other Hamas targets. Since reaching the hospital, the Israeli military has released numerous videos showing what it claims is evidence of a hidden Hamas command center underneath the hospital. The pause has allowed more desperately needed aid into Gaza. The UN says 137 trucks came in. An Israeli government agency says it was 200. Either way, aid groups warn weeks of fighting have left a chasm so big they won't be able to meet the needs of the displaced, hungry and wounded in just a few days. Crystal Gamansing reports and a warning some of the images in her story are distressing. The clock is ticking. The pause in fighting is set to last for four days, and aid groups understand they need to act fast as lives are at risk. For nearly seven weeks in Gaza, Palestinians have been struggling in horrific conditions. Conditions so extreme, kids risk jumping onto a moving truck just to snag some water. We proceed on the basis of the hope and the expectation that we will reach people in need where they are. Um, whether that happens, obviously, I cannot tell you now. Everything from blankets to gas for cooking is needed in the war-torn enclave. The UN says more than 80 percent of the population has been displaced and the medical system has collapsed. Oh! The facilities still open have too many patients and few supplies. Even with the pause in fighting, medical staff didn't get a break. The Associated Press reports two people were fatally shot Friday and 11 wounded individuals were rushed to a hospital in southern Gaza. I was returning to the north when they said there was a truce and they started shooting at us. That is what happened to me. Israeli officials reportedly dropped letters ahead of the pause in fighting, telling Palestinians the war was not over. They should not try to return to the north. People, however, are desperate to go home, hoping, they say, to find a change of clothes, check on loved ones, or honor their dead. There is no life, no food. We can't find a loaf of bread. We don't know what to do anymore. We feel silly just walking in the street. While some people did try to head north back to their homes, others went south to safer locations as instructed by Israeli officials. As for the aid that got into Gaza today, UN officials are calling it the biggest humanitarian convoy delivery since October 7th. Now for context, four to 500 trucks used to make deliveries daily. Farah? Crystal Gomancing in London. Thank you, Crystal. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says a significant humanitarian pause is progress, but many more steps are needed for lasting peace in the region, including a two-state solution. Today, Trudeau was in Newfoundland and Labrador at the European Union Summit. Canada and the EU announced a $1 billion scientific research program, and Canada also hammered out a deal to build water bombers and ship them to the EU. As leaders, we're continuing that work to ensure a future that is safe, that has clean air, that has great jobs, and where there is opportunity for everyone. Trudeau also brought up support for Ukraine as the war rages on, with democratic values under threat around the world. The leaders reaffirmed their commitment to working together. Mackenzie Gray joins us now with all the details. Mackenzie. Yeah, if our EU leaders and Trudeau are on the same page about Ukraine, but back here in Ottawa, the Canadian political consensus on supporting Kyiv took its first hit since the war started. Mr. Scheer. Mr. Schmeel. Mr. Schmeel. That's the entire Conservative caucus voting against updating the Canada-Ukraine Free Trade Agreement on Tuesday. The reason? A new chapter on carbon pricing. He did something that has never been done in the history of trade agreements, which is to put a carbon tax in one. 
But that's not what the agreement says. It does commit Canada and Ukraine to promote carbon pricing and measures to mitigate carbon leakage risks. And even the Ukrainian embassy in Ottawa says the New Deal does not compel either country to implement a fossil fuel levy. But even if it did, Ukraine has had a carbon tax since 2011. Je déclare la motion adoptée. The trade deal still passed its first parliamentary hurdle without conservative support, but the prime minister believes Pierre Polyev has an ulterior motive. The rise of a right-wing American MAGA-influenced thinking that has made Canadian conservatives turn their backs on something Ukraine needs in its hour of need. Trudeau referencing U.S. Republicans who want no further aid to go to Ukraine. Today, more than 300,000 Ukrainian Canadians. The large Ukrainian community in Canada first arrived over 100 years ago and are now concentrated in conservative areas. Nine out of 10 of the largest Ukrainian diaspora groups live in Tory ridings. But even then, support for Kyiv has been slipping with the conservative base. There is a much higher segment among conservative voters whose viewpoint on this is Canada should, should be more likely to stay out of it. Another agreement Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is hoping to ink is with the European Union. And to get that, Ukraine will need to expand their current carbon tax regime to meet EU regulations. Bara. Mackenzie Gray in Ottawa. Thank you, Mackenzie. Zelensky is also hoping to secure more aid packages from the EU and the U.S. Ukraine says Russian forces are escalating attempts to storm a strategically important city in eastern Ukraine. And Russia reported today Ukraine launched a major drone attack on Crimea. It would be the biggest drone attack on the Russia-occupied territory since the start of Russia's full-scale invasion 21 months ago. There was no mention of any casualties or any damage. Irish police have arrested at least 34 people in response to rioting after five people were stabbed in Dublin yesterday. The justice minister says the most riot police in the country's history were deployed. Vehicles were torched, shops were looted and crowds threw rocks. A huge cleanup's now underway. Police blame far right protesters for the unrest. Michael Kovrig is speaking out against allegations by Michael Spavor that Kovrig and the Canadian government had manipulated Spavor, leading to the pair's three-year detainment in China. In a statement, Kovrig says he was never involved in espionage activities and that, quote, any insinuation that I was anything but open and honorable in my interactions with Michael Spavor is false. Spavor is now seeking a multi-million dollar settlement with the federal government. Deal or no deal? How inflation is impacting holiday gift budgets. Coming up, it's not shop till you drop this Black Friday. Black Friday shoppers braved the cold early this morning outside the Mall of America in Minnesota to get, take advantage of this season's biggest deals. On this side of the border, the lineups were more muted. As Navrita Ganguly explains, despite the deep discounts, many Canadians are weighing the choice of spending or saving on this year's gifts. It's the biggest shopping event of the year. Black Friday actually planning for it starts many, many months before the actual weekend. But high inflation has 83% of Canadians expecting holiday gifts to cost them more this year, says Roshan Junja from financial services firm Square. Canadians are really bracing for this thing that we're calling giftflation. Black Friday discounts started earlier than ever this year in an effort to attract customers, according to Marty Weintraub. Everyone's rushing to grab that consumer, especially this season. So. The sooner they can get out there and get those deals in front of consumers, the better shop retailer state they have of capture the wallet. There used to be lots of lineups, but uh, now we're finding that a lot of customers are shopping early, they're shopping online. One in three Canadians plans to start their holiday shopping in November, according to a Deloitte survey. With 11% saying they will complete all their shopping between Black Friday and Cyber Monday. With Canadians shelling out more for food, shelter and other essentials, Deloitte expects holiday spending will fall 11% compared to last year. It's not really something we're focused on. The economy in general is just hard to manage as a university student. On the other hand, Jinja says many shoppers will actually stretch their budgets to give their loved ones the best gifts that they can. About half of them are going to up their budget and they're going to up their budget about 20%. So. 
that to me indicates that folks still value the importance of gift giving and celebrating the holiday season. But overspending is a serious concern, one that could persist long after the holidays. You know, household debt levels in Canada have been rising. And you know, what we don't want to have is that surprise credit card statement, oh, when we open up the bills come January. Nivrita Ganguly, Global News, Toronto. Ahead, how a BC Indigenous community is taking on an oil giant over a $35 billion pipeline expansion project. Some members of a BC Indigenous community are voicing their opposition to the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion's new route through a sacred site. Those against the move say they won't back down. And as Nithu Garcha reports, it sparked doubt in other communities over agreements already signed. The little creek over here, we have uh, coho salmon, we have cutthroat and rainbow trout. People don't realize how much life is sustained by a little creek like that. The richness of these ancestral homelands, Sumas First Nation Chief Dalton Silver says, is precious and needs to be protected. It's why he's conflicted over the agreement his nation, about an hour east of Vancouver, has signed with Trans Mountain. It goes against my, I guess, my gut feeling. He says in early November, a salmon-bearing stream was affected as workers were drilling in the territory. Trans Mountain confirms 54 fish in a slew in his territory died this week after crews evacuated a site, turning off a water pump following an avian flu scare. The company is investigating the incident and says it's complying with all regulatory requirements. They came too close to the bottom of the waterway and it collapsed. That same week, Trans Mountain was ordered to stop pipeline work over environmental infractions in one of the nation's wetland areas. Chief Silver says he worries about his nation's ability to monitor the company's compliance in protecting the land and sacred Indigenous sites. Staff that are closely monitoring things as, as much as we can. Right. But like a lot of other places, I think we're short-staffed. We've seen the desecration of so many sacred places and our people in general are really looking, I think, to, to maintain identity and maintain the cultural ways. A sacred site in BC's interior called Pipsel at Jacko Lake is a source of controversy. It is in our territory, on unceded territory, unceded land. It's our territory uh, that uh, nobody goes around it and disturbs it. Canada's energy regulator recently ruled in favour of Trans Mountain to revise its pipeline route and dig an open trench here, despite opposition from community members like Carolyn Henry. They just walk all over you and expect you to take it. And we're not going to take it. We will not back down ourselves through our own territory. You know, looking back at this proposal and this pipeline, it, it's going to look strange that it just was pushed through against people's opposition. We actually... Um negotiated a, a relationship agreement that was unique in that I don't think there were any other First Nations that had that. Chief Silver says terms in his nation's agreement with Trans Mountain give him some comfort over his concerns. We can have all the money in the world, but if, uh, if the resources are all destroyed around us, if, if we're in a place that the livability is actually in question, well, where do we go? as he's constantly questioning whether it's a risk worth taking. Neetu Garja, Global News, Sumas First Nation. The Minnesota Wild is celebrating Native American Heritage Night at its game this evening. But the NHL has quashed how a goalie planned to embrace the idea. Marc-Andre Fleury, who plays for the Wilds and is from Quebec, had a custom mask painted to honor his wife and her family's Indigenous heritage. The NHL, however, has threatened to find Fleury and the team if he wears it during tonight's game or even during the warm-up. Next, how a Canadian company is embracing artificial intelligence in the workplace. Artificial intelligence is just about everywhere, from our smartphones to our home assistants, and Canada ranks in the top five countries for research and development. This week on The New Reality, Mike Drolet looks at how our workforce is getting an overhaul, while federal regulations lag behind. 
Air Canada, like so many other companies, finds itself at a crossroads. Keep doing what they're doing and let the competition pass them by, or embrace how artificial intelligence can transform everything. AI is here whether we like it or not. Bruce Stam has been charged with getting the ball rolling. Last month, Air Canada started using an AI-powered program to set its schedules. Next year, AI will be used to streamline maintenance schedules, which Stam says will make the company more efficient and profitable. And we never take the human out of the loop in terms of decision making. None of the systems that we have built have actually removed somebody. It's more giving them the ability to look at numerous permutations and combinations that, that otherwise would take hours to do. AI often gets a bad rap, but not all AI programs are created equal. Shall we play a game? Deep learning oh. AI is what you see in most Hollywood movies. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. And yes, that can be terrifying. But where Canada has set itself apart is with machine learning AI, which only works with human input. By most metrics, Canada is a top five AI country for research and development. AI is a transformative technology that is going to make the world a much better place and help us solve some of the most pressing challenges as a society that we face right now. Where the AI world falls short is in regulation. Canada won't see laws in place until 2025 at the earliest. Until then, there's a voluntary code of conduct for the industry. There's an acknowledgement. We need to deal with the concerns and the risks so that we can realize the opportunities. And in order to do that, uh, we need framework. We need guardrails so we build trust with people. AI, it is said, will change the world in ways never seen before. And Canada has a front row seat. Fasten your seat belts. Mike Drolet, Global News, Toronto. Mike speaks with some of the Canadian leaders in AI and looks at the innovations coming soon. That's Saturday at 7 p.m. on The New Reality. And that's Global National for this Friday night. I'm Farah Nasser, and tonight's Your Canada is Nathan Phillips Square in downtown Toronto. Until tomorrow, take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Good night.